our paragraph right there at the top. It says the word gospel means what, everyone? Good news or good tidings. The whole Bible is filled with good news. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Even the subject of what? Hell, rightly understood, is good news. There have been down through the ages significant misunderstandings about the subject of hell. In this lesson, we will seek to cut through these misunderstandings and pre-programmed pr pictures in order to arrive at what kind of truth? Bible truth. If we let the Bible speak, we will surely succeed. Let's go to the book of Revelation, chapter 20. Revelation, chapter 20. And in order to properly understand hell, we're going to have to look at hell in its chronological context. And that is how it relates to the, si the issue of the millennium. Now, how many of you have heard that term before, the millennium, in reference to the Bible? Okay, it's a very simple word. It comes from two words, mille, which is 1,000, and annum, which is years. 1,000 years. We're in Revelation chapter 20, and I'm beginning in verse 1. What verse, everyone? Verse 1. John says, Then I saw an angel coming down from where? Heaven, having the keys to the bottomless pit, and a great chain in his hand, and he laid a hold of the who? Dragon. Who's the dragon? Satan, that serpent of old, who was the devil and Satan, and bound him for how long? thousand years. Now the word millennium does not actually occur in the Bible, but it comes from this idea of 1,000 years. Millie, a thousand annum years. 1,000 years. So he was bound for 1,000 years. Verse 3. And cast him into the bottomless pit and shut him up. Aren't you glad to know that Satan's going to be shut up someday? Amen. Shut him up and set a seal on him so that he should what? Deceive the nations no more until the thousand years were what, everyone? finished. But after these things, he must be released for a little while. Verse 4, I saw thrones, John saw, said, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of those who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God. Serious business to follow the Lord, who had not worshipped the beast nor his image, and who had not received the mark on their foreheads or in their hands. And they lived and reigned with Christ for how long, everyone? One thousand years. Verse 5, but the rest of the dead lived not again until the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Verse 6, blessed and holy is he who has part in which resurrection? The first resurrection. Over such the what? Second death has no power, and they shall be priests of God and of Christ, and shall reign with him for how long, everyone? 1,000 years. So you see that time period coming up there several times. 1,000 years, 1,000 years, 1,000 years. Now you'll notice something. The Bible here speaks of the second death. Of the what death? The second death. Let me just be very plain with you right at the outset here. The second death is hell. That's what hell is. Hell is the second death. Now think about it for just a moment. If you have a second death, what do you have by definition? You have a first death. And why does the Bible make the point of saying this is the first resurrection? Because there are, in fact, guess how many resurrections? Two resurrections. Look at your study guide there. It says, the clear teaching of Scripture is that there are how many resurrections? Two resurrections. Jesus himself affirmed this in John chapter 5, verse 28. We've already quoted that verse for you in our last presentation when Jesus said, Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in the which all who are in the graves will hear his voice. Some will come forth to the resurrection of life and others to the resurrection of condemnation. And so there are how many resurrections? Two resurrections. And we get that right from Revelation chapter 20 where it says this is the first resurrection. And so what we have here, very simple, the millennium is a period of time, 1,000 years, that is bookended. That is to say, on this end, you have a bookend, so to speak. And on this end, you have a bookend. And those two bookends are the resurrections. The first resurrection takes place at the beginning of the millennium. The second resurrection takes place at the end of the millennium. Now, let's just cut right to the chase. The first resurrection is the resurrection of the righteous. The resurrection of the who, everyone? The righteous. That's why it says, blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection. The second resurrection then would be the resurrection of the who? The wicked. Okay, now think about this for just a moment. When Jesus returns, there will be four groups of people. Now, you might have heard me say before there will be two groups, but I want to make it a little more complex and a little more accurate here. In the past, we've said there are two groups of people, the wheat and the tares. But we're going to further subdivide the wheat and the tares into the living and the dead. And so there would be four groups of people. You'd have the righteous living and the righteous dead, and the wicked living and the wicked dead. If that makes sense, say amen. Every single person that is living or has ever lived can fit into one of those four categories. Either the righteous living or the righteous dead or the wicked living or the wicked dead. Amen, everyone? So far, so good. So let's look at the five events that begin the millennium. We know that the millennium takes place here at the time of the first resurrection. Then there's that period of 1,000 years where Satan is bound. And then the second resurrection comes at the end of the 1,000 years. Let's try and put this together. The second coming is the event, the first event that commences or begins the millennium. What is it, everyone? The second coming of 
Christ. There are many uh, evidences that we could give to this, but let's just look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 15 to 17. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are, what are these words? Alive and what? Remain until the what? The coming of the Lord. So is someone going to be alive when Jesus returns, yes or no? Yes, just like Elijah and just like Enoch, they will go to heaven without seeing death. The, the, the theological term for that, the technical term for that is they will be translated. They will be what, everyone? Translated. That is, they will be lifted from here to there without ever having to pass through that experience of death. So notice what it says. For this we say unto you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain unto the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are what? Asleep. And someone tells me, tell me please, what does the word asleep mean in this context in the Bible? Those who are dead. That's exactly right. Notice the next verse, verse 16. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise what? First. So that is to say that those who had fallen asleep with their faith in Jesus, they will be resurrected first. Resurrected what? First. That's what we just read. Blessed and holy is he who has part in the first resurrection, on such the second death has no power. And that's exactly what Paul says here. The dead in Christ rise when, everyone? First. Not second, but first. Notice verse 17. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, what's the next word? Yeah. Together. That's a critical word. With them in the clouds to meet the Lord, where? In the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Can someone say amen? And so, when Jesus Christ returns, the resurrection of the righteous takes place. If that makes sense, I want you to say amen. So those are the first two events that begin the millennium. All we're going to do, very simple, is we're going to look at five events that begin the millennium and then five events that end the millennium. And you'll be able to see that basically you have this period of 1,000 years. Here's the five events that commence the millennium. Here's the five events that end the millennium. And in the meantime, the devil's on a 1,000-year vacation where he's shut up. Can someone say amen? Okay. So the resurrection of the righteous takes place as we have already said. The next then is the translation of the living righteous. Let's go back to those four groups of people. The righteous living and the righteous dead. We've already dealt with those two groups of people. What happens to the righteous living when Jesus returns? The, the Bible says they are translated or caught up with God into heaven. Okay, they are translated. What's that word, everyone? Translated. What happens to the righteous dead when Jesus returns? Resurrected. Okay, so we've already dealt with two of our four groups. Okay, four groups of people, the righteous living and the righteous dead, the wicked living and the wicked dead. We've already dealt with two of them because those that had fallen asleep in Christ are raised from the dead and those who are alive and remained unto the coming of the Lord are going to be translated to heaven without saying de seeing death. And oh Lord, when the saints go marching in, I want to be in that number. Can someone say amen? amen? Okay, so see, we're just working our way through this in a methodical manner. Some will be alive when Jesus returns. They will be translated without dying. Amen? Powerful. So now we continue. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 51. This is exactly what the Apostle Paul says. Listen, I tell you a what? Mystery. We will not all what? Sleep. What's that a reference to? We will not all die, but we will all be changed in a flash in the twinkling of an eye at the last what? Trumpet. Second time we've seen that tonight. Notice verse 52. For the trumpet will sound, the dead will be raised imperishable, and we will be changed. For this perishable must put... Uh, clothe itself with the imperishable, and this mortal must clothe itself with what? Immortality. That's exactly right. We've already talked about that. So that takes place there at the last trump. He says, we won't all sleep, but we will all be changed. Can someone say amen? So, second coming of Jesus, the righteous are resurrected, the translation of the living righteous, the wicked living are slain. That is to say, the Bible says that they are destroyed with the brightness or the glory of His coming. On one occasion, Moses was on top, on top of Mount Sinai, and he said to God, God, I want to see what you look like. And God said, I'll show you what I look like on three conditions. Number one, I'm going to put you in the cleft of the rock. Number two, I'm going to put my hand over you. And number three, you have to see only my back parts, because he said, no man can see my face and what? Live. Okay, the idea here is that if God just decided to make an appearance here tonight in this room in His unmuted glory, every one of us would be immediately, instantaneously vaporized because of the amazing, consuming fire of the glory of God. Can you say amen? Very simple. And so what happens to the wicked, those who are alive when Jesus returns, they are slain either by the cataclysm of the events surrounding the second coming or by His glory. Notice this from 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verses 7 and 8. Very simple, easy to understand. And to give to you who are troubled, rest with us when the Lord Jesus is what? Revealed from where? Heaven with His mighty 
angels, notice this, in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God. Now notice verses 8 and 9. On those who do not obey the what? Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to this verse, is it important that we obey the Lord Jesus Christ? Amen? Not in order to be saved, but because we have been saved. Someone say amen. amen. Verse 9. These shall be punished with everlasting, what's that word? Destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power. And so those who are alive and remain of the wicked now, when Jesus returns in His resplendent glory, they are destroyed with the brightness of His coming. I could quote you another text, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8, but you can just write that down. This is 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 8, but 2 Thess Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 8 says the same thing. And so we've dealt with three of the four groups. In fact, in a, in a, in a, in a, uh, actually, we've dealt with all four, if you just think about it. So, what happens to the righteous living when Jesus returns? Righteous living. They're caught up in, what's that word? Translated. What happens to the righteous dead when Jesus returns? Resurrected. What happens to the wicked living when Jesus returns? Destroyed by the brightness of His coming. And what would happen to the wicked dead? Uh, nothing. They would just stay there. That's exactly right. We'll come back to that in a minute. Incidentally, there's going to be a second resurrection. Who do you think will come up in the second resurrection? Now think about it. If the righteous come up in the first resurrection, who would come up in the second resurrection? The wicked. So there's no point in anything happening to the wicked dead at this point because they're going to stay dead through the 1,000 years and at the close of the 1,000 years, they'll be raised from the dead. If that makes sense, say amen. In fact, let me just show you that very quickly. Go back to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, what I'm trying to do here, instead of keeping you in suspense and then sort of saying, aha, drama, aha, drama, I'm just giving you the whole picture right from the Bible so you can see it plain as the noonday sun. Revelation chapter 20, and let's it pick it up in verse 5. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5. It says, but the rest of the dead, that would be the wicked, did not live again until the thousand years were what? Finished. So there it is. Let's continue on here. And so these are the five events that commence the millennium. The five events that begin the millennium. Number one, the second coming of Christ, which results in the resurrection of the righteous. Number two. Number three, the translation of the living righteous. Number four, the wicked living are what? Slain. And Satan is bound for how long, everyone? 1,000 years. So far, so good. See, this is very simple. Now, notice that it says that Satan is bound with a chain. He's bound with a what? Did you see that? I'm reading now in verses 1 and 2. Then I saw an angel coming down from heaven, Revelation 20, having a key to the bottomless pit and a great chain in his hand. And he laid hold on the dragon, the serpent of old, who was called the devil and Satan, and he bound him for 1,000 years. And we're going to ask a very legitimate question here. Is Satan bound with a literal chain? What are these chains that bind Satan? Is it realistic to expect that a spiritual being would be bound with a literal chain? I think the answer is no. What we discover according to the Bible is that Satan is bound with a chain of what? Circumstances. In the same way that I might say, oh, I'd love to have lunch with you. I'd love to be able to come over. I'd love to be able to do such and such. But my hands are tied. Are my hands really tied? No, what I'm saying is, is that circumstances beyond my control are making it difficult for me to work you into my schedule or for you to work me into your schedule. So I say, oh, my hands are tied, but my hands aren't really tied. And so when it says that Satan is bound, it means he's bound by a chain of circumstances. Now think about that for just a moment. Satan's job is to deceive and to destroy human beings. If that makes sense, say amen. Oh, but wait a minute. Where are all the human beings at this point? Well, let's go down our four, four, four groups of people there. Where are the righteous living? Okay, they've been caught up. Where were the uh, righteous dead? Okay, they've been caught up. How about the uh, wicked living? Okay, they've been slain. And what about the wicked dead? They've okay, so where is everyone? Their answer is they're gone at this point. We're going to say, well, where are they gone? We're going to talk about that in just a moment. But if no one's around for Satan to deceive and to destroy and to harass, then he would be bound by a chain of circumstances because there's nothing he can do. If that makes sense, say Amen. I mean, the idea of binding Satan with a literal rope or a literal chain is not exactly what the uh, revelator had in mind here. So notice Revelation chapter 6, verse 15, describing the second coming. It says, And the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the commanders, the mighty men, every slave and every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains. This is a horrific scene describing the second coming of Jesus for those who had not put their faith in the Lord. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us and what? Hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne. And look at this. From the wrath of the, what's that word? Notice it doesn't say the wrath of the lion. Uh, gentlemen, I dare say that if you were walking through the woods with your sweet friend, perhaps your wife or maybe just a special friend, and a lamb jumped out on the pathway and you said, ah! 
and ran cow, you know, cowering in the opposite direction, I don't think that things would ever be the same between you and your spouse again. Are we clear on that? <laughs> Notice it says here, from the wrath of the what? The wrath of the Lamb. I mean, wh what's going on here? They hadn't put their faith in Jesus as Messiah, and so now when He returns, they're afraid of Him. Absolutely amazing. Verse 17, for the great day of His what? Wrath has come, and John the Revelator says, who can stand? The rocks are falling. It's a great, cataclysmic, catastrophic, cacophonous event. The rocks are falling everywhere. The Bible says in Peter that the rocks were melting with fervent heat. There's a great earthquake. And the people are literally running to the rocks saying, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. Next uh, verse here is Isaiah chapter 24, verses 19 and 20. The earth is, what's that word? Violently broken. The earth is split open. The earth is shaken exceedingly. This is describing the second coming. The earth shall reel to and fro like a drunkard and shall totter like a what? Like a hut. Notice that. Verses 20 and 21. Its transgression shall be heavy upon it and it will fall and not. What's the next word? Words. Rise again. It shall come to pass in that day that the Lord will punish on high the host of the exalted ones and the earth, the kings of the earth. And so when Jesus returns, it is a cataclysmic, catastrophic event. If that makes sense, say amen. Now, this was described in many different ways in both the Old and the New Testament. It says a great earthquake or as a mighty thundering. It says that every island and mountain is disappearing. It's going to be an absolutely amazing event. They will be gathered, verse 22 of Isaiah 24, together as prisoners are gathered in the what? Pit. And they will be shut up in the prison. After many days, they will be punished. This is describing the millennium event. Jesus Christ returns. The earth is put into a state of disrepair. It is utterly shattered and destroyed. The wicked go down into the grave for how many years, everyone? One thousand years. But notice it says, after many days they will be punished. You're getting it. That's exactly right. And so you should be able to fill all of that in there. Look now at your study guide at the bottom of page one. Study guide, bottom of page one, it says, the Bible describes the earth as being a bottomless pit. A bottomless what, everyone? Pit. Pit. This phrase comes from the Greek word abusos. Let's see if we can find that. It's right here. This is the word. The, the Greek word here, when it says that the earth is like a bottomless pit, is that word right there, abusos. And what English word does that sound like? Abyss. That's what you'd write in right there. What English word does this sound like? Abyss. Now, this is very important. Not coincidentally, the word abusos is used to translate the condition of the earth in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. You know Genesis 1, 1, where it says, The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. In the Septuagint, now the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Okay? So the Greeks, they translated in the days of Jesus. They didn't always read the Old Testament in Hebrew. They took the Old Testament, which is originally written in Hebrew, and they wrote it in Greek. And when they translated that word, those verses there in Genesis chapter 1, it says the earth was without form and void. They used that word, abusos. The idea is of a great abyss without form and void. And we've given you several texts there at the bottom that corroborate that. Basically, John the Revelator saw this earth absolutely thrashed and trashed after the second coming of Jesus. To him, it looked like a great bottomless pit. Mountains had been laid to waste. Islands had disappeared. There was no man. Total destruction reigned. We've already seen the rocks and the mountains are falling, etc., etc. This raises the question we've actually already answered. Is there anyone alive on earth during the millennium? What's the answer? No. Now, you might say, yes, someone is alive, but who would that be? Satan and his angels. Notice the top of the second page of the study guide. The earth is desolate following the second coming. Satan and the fallen angels are left alone for 1,000 years to contemplate the woeful result of their rebellious experiment. The righteous are where? In heaven, but what are they doing there? That's a good question. We're going to see that in just a moment. Go back to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, and we'll pick it up in verse 4. Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat on them, and judgment was committed to them. Then I saw the souls of them who had been beheaded for their witness to Jesus and for the word of God that had not worshipped the beast or his image, and that had not received his mark on their foreheads or on their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ for how long? One thousand years. Now notice it says that judgment was given to them. What was given? Judgment. Very interesting. Look at this prophecy from Jeremiah chapter 4, verses 23 and 24. Jeremiah in vision says, I beheld the earth, and indeed it was without form and what? 
void. That sounds like creation, doesn't it? The problem is he's not talking about creation at all, and you'll discover that here in just a moment. And the heavens, they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and indeed they trembled, and the hills moved back and forth. I beheld, and indeed there was how many men? There was no man. And all the birds of the heavens had fled. I beheld, and indeed the fruitful land was a wilderness. This is Jeremiah seeing this in vision. And all the cities were broken down at the what? Presence of the Lord by his fierce what? Anger. So is this talking about creation? Not at all. This is talking about destruction. But when Jeremiah perceived it, when Isaiah perceived it, when John the Revelator perceived the earth, after the destruction that had commenced at the second coming of Jesus, it looked to them like the earth probably looked in the beginning. Just a void, vacuous mass. He says in verse 27, For thus says the Lord, the whole land shall be, what's that word? Desolate. Notice he says, but I will not make a full end. Something is going to happen at the end of the what? 1,000 years. Jeremiah 25, 33. And at that day the slain of the Lord shall be from one end of earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented. That means no one's going to be crying for them. No one's going to gather them or bury them. They shall become as refuse on the ground. I mean, it's just a very ugly picture, a terrible picture. So these are the five events. Second coming of Christ. Resurrection of righteous. Translation of living righteous. The wicked living are slain and Satan is bound. If it makes sense up to this point, say amen. amen. So far, so good. We're doing great. So there's our 1,000 years. Here's the first part. Come all the way down. And here's the second part with the second resurrection. Now, we did ask the question, the righteous are in heaven, but what are they doing? Well, we've seen there in verse 4 of Revelation chapter 20 that they are looking at books. They're looking at what? Now, let me show you a very, very interesting verse that many New Testament Christians are not even aware exists. It found, it's found in the little book of 1 Corinthians. See if you can find that there in the New Testament, 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Okay, so you have Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, Romans, and then 1 Corinthians chapter 6. Very unusual verse, an interesting verse. Paul was writing to the church at Corinth, and they were suing one another. They were what, everyone? Suing one another. And Paul writes a letter of rebuke to them, and he says something very interesting in 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And notice with me verse 1. Dare any of you, having a matter against another, go to the law before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Verse 2, do you not know that the saints will judge the, what is that next word? Now, according to Paul, are the saints going to judge the world, yes or no? Notice what he goes, if you think that's amazing, look at what he says next. And if the world is going to be judged by you, are you not unworthy to judge in the smallest matters? In other words, hey, listen, why are you taking one another to court? You're going to judge the whole world. Stop, stop messing around with these trifling little silly matters. And look at verse 3. This is absolutely out of this world. Do you not know that we will judge? What's that next word? Angels. Angels. How much more the things that pertain to this life? Now, with a raising of hands here, how many people knew that we would be judging angels? How many people knew that? That's going to be new information for a whole lot of people. Does Paul here say that the saints will judge the world? Yes or no? Does Paul say here that the saints will judge angels, yes or no? Absolutely. So here's what's happening. All of the wicked, shoo, dead, okay? Slain or remained in the grave. The righteous are in heaven. They're where, everyone? In heaven because this earth is an absolute desolated wilderness. And they're in heaven judging. You say, what? They're in heaven judging. That's exactly what the Bible says. Look at it there again in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 4. Revelation chapter 20, what verse, everyone? Verse 4, John says, I saw thrones and they that sat upon them and judgment was committed to them. What was committed to them? Judgment. judgment. And so here the righteous are judging. You say, well, in what sense are they judging? Very simple. I'll give you the quick answer. When you get to heaven, there are going to be three surprises. Number one, that you're there. <laughs> Someone say amen. amen. <laughs> you're going to be. And number two, people that you were just sure were going to be there aren't going to be there. I mean, beloved, it's not, it's not uncommon. I mean, it's not something that you don't know. I mean, even just recently, we have this uh, very well-known White House uh, uh, counseling evangelist there in Colorado named Ted Haggard. And, uh, you know, there's these accusations against him. And boom, it turns up that he's probably using crystal meth and hiring male prostitutes. Now, the jury's still out, but those are the charges against him. There's going to be a lot of people that everyone would have said, oh, yeah, he's bound for heaven. And I'm not making a judgment here on Ted Haggard. What I'm showing is, is that people may be living the religious life but you don't know what's going on behind the scenes. Someone say amen. I mean, I can fool you, but I can't fool the Lord. Someone say amen. But then there's going to be other people who you thought were absolute jerks your whole life. And you thought, no way. I mean, I'm just so glad I'm going to heaven. I'm not going to have to be with that guy. And you're going to be walking down the golden streets one day. You're going to look across. No. 
Johnny Stanton made it to heaven. It was Johnny. What, how, what happened? He's going to tell you this powerful story of how he was converted. And he's so sorry for all those times he beat you up on the playground or stole your lunch money, whatever it was. Okay? So there'll be three surprises when you get to heaven. Number one, you're there. Number two, people you thought should be there aren't going to be there. And people you thought would never make it are going to be there. And we're going to have questions in heaven. We're going to have what? I have questions right now. Someone asked us the other night, well, what about all the aborted babies? Hey, I don't know the answer to that question, but God knows the answer. Someone say amen. amen. Uh, before I became a Christian, I had a job for three years taking care of people with developmental disabilities, Down syndrome, autism, and other things, fetal alcohol syndrome. And uh, I had good friends, but most of them had mental capacities of two, three, four, five, six, seven years old. And I, I was friends with these people, and I always wondered after I became a Christian, how will God judge them? We're going to have questions, everyone. Can you say Amen. So someone you just thought for sure was going to be in heaven turns up not there. You're going to say, well, God, what gives? And he's going to say, well, come here and I'll show you what gives. Take a look in the books. And we'll be going over the books, not to change any of God's judgments, but to say, just and true are your ways, O King of Saints. Can you say amen? amen. And we're going to say, but God, well, we've always had this question. And I know every person in this room has had this question. What about the devil? I mean, you knew the devil was going to fall. Why did you create the devil if you knew it? Of course, God didn't create the devil. He created Lucifer, and Lucifer by his own choice created the devil. But you know what I'm saying. Why did you allow that to happen? There's not a person in this room who hasn't asked that question. Someone say amen. So we're going to say, hey, God, what about that one? He's going to say, let me show you. Let me show you. Notice it said there in 1 Corinthians chapter 6 that we would judge angels. We would judge what? Angels. Lucifer was a what? Fallen angel. So we're going to be looking at the decisions that God made, and God's going to say, hey, look at I didn't do everything in a corner. I'm not trying to hide these things from you. Take a look at the decisions and the judgments that I've made, and you tell me if you would have done anything different. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 15, at the end of all this, we will cry out, Just and true are thy ways, O King of saints. Can someone say amen? But this tells us something awesome about our God. He is not going to administer a terminal judgment until he is totally satisfied that all of the citizens of his kingdom are satisfied that he has made just and true and loving judgment. Someone say amen. Because if that wasn't the case, sometime throughout the ceaseless ages of eternity, we might wonder why God did this or this or this or this or this. And if we don't have good answers, we may be tempted to serve God out of fear. Out of, what did I say? Fear. But this is not a proper reason to serve God. It's not a proper motivator. God will only accept the service of love. You've got it. And so we will be in heaven going over the books and reviewing. This is what's called a judicial review. Any attorney can tell you there's such a thing as a judicial review, and that's what's going to be happening with the righteous in heaven. Now, there are five events that close the millennium, and you're right there in your study guide. Let's see how quickly we can do this. Five events. So, at the end of the millennium, the wicked are raised. The wicked are what? We already read that in Revelation chapter 20 and verse 5. I'll read it for you again very quickly. The rest of the dead live not again until the thousand years were finished. And so, here it comes. The end of the millennium, the wicked are raised. Number two, Satan is set free. Now think about that. That makes such good sense. It's not as though Satan is bound with a literal chain. What kind of a chain? Literal, literal chain. He was bound by a chain of circumstances because there was no one around to tempt. But if all of the wicked are suddenly raised to life... Is he now released from those circumstances that bound him? Yes or no? Because there would be t people to tempt and to, that's right, to harass. Notice. Number three, the new Jerusalem descends from heaven. You pick that up in Revelation chapter 21. I'm reading quickly. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, verse 1. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away and there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, uh, pardon me, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And so the new Jerusalem begins to descend. All of the righteous are in the new Jerusalem. Powerful, the new Jerusalem descending. John saw it as a bride prepared and adorned for her husband. And so the wicked are destroyed. You say, what? The wicked are destroyed? I missed that part. Go to Revelation chapter 20. You've got to see this. This is absolutely fantabulously, biblically powerful. Revelation chapter 20, and I'm in verse 7. What verse am I in, everyone? Seven. It says, now when the thousand years have expired, Satan will be released from his what? Prison. Question, what releases him from his prison? The resurrection of the wicked. So now there are people to tempt. 
And so the devil begins to marshal them all together. And what does he do? Verse 8, he goes out to deceive. He's right back to his old games. He didn't repent. He had a thousand years to think about his foolish and unwise decisions. And the moment he's given another opportunity, he's right back to the same old, same old. Deceive, deceive, deception, deception. It says he goes out to deceive the nations which are in the four corners of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to the battle whose number the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city. And fire came down from God out of heaven and did what? Devour them. They're going to try and take the city by force. Satan deceives them. He says, hey, we can take that city. That's my city. I mean, who knows what he says to try and persuade them in this ludicrous, ill-fated adventure. He says we can take the city. And when God looks down and sees that none of the wicked are repentant, none of them are what? Repentant. Never forget this, people. Never, 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 never forget this. If anyone in this room is lost, it will not be because God wouldn't accept you, but because you chose not to accept God. Someone say amen. amen. There's not going to be anybody that God says, I didn't like him. I didn't want her up there. No, 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 no. If anyone is lost in this room or out of this room, it'll be because they said, I don't want to have anything to do with God. God is a gentleman. He will not ah, 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 twist your arm and make you do the right thing. Someone say amen. But like a rabid dog who knows he's going to die anyway, one last chance, one last fix, and they begin to surround the city to try and take by force what they wouldn't receive by grace. Mm. The Bible says that fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them. What does it do? It devours them. So the wicked are destroyed. All the wicked who have ever lived try to take the city by force. Verse 9, they went up on the breadth of the earth and surrounded the camp of the saints in the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven. And what did it do, everyone? It devoured them. What does the word devour mean? It means destroyed. And then the earth is made what? New. You're in Revelation chapter 20. Look with me at verse 14. Revelation chapter 20, and I'm reading in verse 14. It says, Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the what? Second death. So if you have a second death, what do you know you have? It's a, it's a mathematical, axiological truth that if you have a second death, you have a first death. And then notice verse 15. Anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the what? Lake of fire. What's the lake of fire? It's that fire that descends from God out of heaven and devours them. Then the very next thing that you see, Revelation chapter 20, verse 1, John sees that new, that holy city, that wonderful city, the new Jerusalem, descending from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her uh, husband. Boom, right down there on the planet earth. And then God makes a new earth. Someone say amen. amen. You say, oh, wait, whoa, whoa, wait a minute. God makes a new earth? Absolutely. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Absolutely powerful. And I could give, oh, Lord have mercy. We could go on and on and on. The meek shall inherit the earth. There will be people who have put their trust in Jesus. There will be no pain, no death, no sorrow, no disease. The Bible says the former things have passed away. No war, no terrorism, no 9-11, no conspiracy theories, no garbage, no trash. Someone say amen. I'm tempted to say no Republicans and no Democrats either. Hallelujah. Only Christians. The meek shall inherit the earth. If you believe that, say amen. amen. Praise God in heaven. I'm tired of this old place. Everybody that's alive will be either inside of that city, that's the righteous, or outside of the city, that's the wicked. I'm looking at your study guide. Inside or outside? Inside or outside? At the close of the millennium following the resurrection of the wicked, everyone who has ever lived will be alive all at the same what? Time. What a sight that will be. All of the righteous inside of the city, the New Jerusalem, all of the wicked will be outside of the city, the New Jerusalem. The Bible says that the walls of the New Jerusalem are what? Clear. Revelation 21, 18. Clear gold. The righteous and the wicked will be able to see one another. The wicked make an effort to overtake the city by force. It is at this time that the fires of the vengeance of the judgment of God descend upon them. And what was that word, everyone? Devour them. Now here, I'm going to tell you something that's absolutely amazing from a biblical perspective. That fire that devours them, that brings about the second death, that fire is hell. That's what did I say, everyone? That's hell. Let me just make this as plain as can be. Hell is not burning right now. 
I don't know what you've believed before, but I'm going to tell you biblically, hell is not burning right now. Purgatory is not burning right now. There's not one scintilla, one iota of Bible evidence that says anything about a purgatory. That's a tradition. That's a what? A tradition. Also, this idea that hell is right now and people are down in the hot place, you know, getting poked, poked, poked by the devil and he's turning them over in skewers and throughout the sea. I mean, give me a break. This is the most ridiculous thing. You won't find anything in the Bible about that. This fire that descends at the close of the millennium that devours the rebellious, this is hellfire. Now, let's move now to the next part of our study, this idea of hell. Jesus said, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I say? That's a good question. Can you say amen? If we're going to call ourselves Christians, then we should be obeying Jesus and not anyone else. Someone say amen. I love Jesus' question. He's able to cut right to the heart of the matter. He says, hey, why are you calling me Lord and don't do the things I say? It's easy to put a little sticker on the back of your Honda Accord. It's quite a different thing to obey the Lord of glory. Someone say amen. amen. He says, hey, hey, whoa, whoa, whoa. You call yourself a Christian. Why do you call me Lord and don't do what I ask you? The Lord Jesus gives us his plain, explicit commands, the Ten Commandments. I and mean, we could talk about the simple things that God has made clear. And he says, hey, if you're going to call me Lord, why don't you do what I say or what I command? Very, very simple. So, the word hell occurs 54 times in the Bible. I'm going to see if you can keep up with me here. It's right there in your study guide. The word hell occurs how many times? 54 times in the King James Version of the Bible. In the Old Testament, hell is translated 31 times from the Hebrew word sheol. That's right in your study guide, which simply means grave or place of the departed. Now, the reason I'm bringing that out is this. If I say hell... And I say, what picture comes to your mind? I can almost guarantee flames come to your mind. Lava comes to your mind. Fire and brimstone comes to your mind. That is not what would have come to the mind to a Hebrew. The word hell is from the word sheol, which simply means grave. It had no connotation of burning whatsoever. No connotation of what? Burning whatsoever. And that's every use of hell in the Old Testament. Every use of hell in the Old Testament, 31 times, is the word sheol, which simply means grave. What does it mean, everyone? Great. We come to the New Testament. There are two Greek words that are translated as hell, Hades and Gehenna. Hades and Gehenna. You want to write those down. And only one of those words has anything to do with burning, and that's that word right there, Gehenna. Hades is just exactly like the Old Testament word Sheol. It means grave or place of the departed. Okay? So we're going to ask several questions here about hell. We're going to ask, when does hell take place? Where does hell take place? Which we've actually already answered. And how long? How what, everyone? How long? So we're right there at the top of your study guide, page 3. Praise the Lord Jesus. We're making good time. Okay, here we go. When is hell? Well, first of all, hell is not right now. Someone say amen. amen. Hell takes place at the end of the millennium. When is hell? Hell takes place after the thousand years. Question number two, where is hell? Hell takes place right here on planet Earth. Hell is not some place underneath the ground. If you dig down far enough through the various layers of, you know, sediment, you're going to find a hot place down there with several barbecue pits. No, 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 no. Hell takes place right here on planet Earth. When the fires that descend from God devour the wicked and actually is recreated anew, the Earth made new. Can you say amen? So that answers the question of when. That answers the question of where. Now look at this one. What about the question of how long? The question, how long, is an easily answered question. It's a what, everyone? It's an, how, how, what is it answered? Easily answered. Okay, hang on. Buckle your safety belts, by the way. Do you have safety belts there in your seats? You might want to buckle them. As we have already learned, human beings are not naturally immortal. Can you say amen if that's true? Human beings are not naturally immortal. Immortality is a gift, hallelujah, you're already getting it, is a gift from God that comes as a result of accepting Jesus Christ as your personal what? Savior. Let's all say it together. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So if you believe, what do you get? Everlasting life. But if you don't believe, what do you get? Perishing. Notice it doesn't say, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not have everlasting life in the eternal fires of hell, but have everlasting life in heaven. Is that what the verse says? Well, the verse says that whoever believes in him won't perish. Won't what? Perish. But have the opposite of perishing, which is everlasting life. Now, this gets absolutely incredible. You need to hone in here on these underlined sections. It is absolutely critical to understand this simple point. If man is not, what's the next word? Immortal. Then there is no need for hell to burn throughout the ceaseless eternal ages. 
To put it another way, the foundational reason that hell has been assumed to be eternal is that man has been assumed to be what? Immortal, immortal and thus indestructible. It is essential that this be understood. If man is not immortal, then there is no need to insist that hell is what? Eternal. Think of it this way. Okay, here it is. Whoosh, whoosh, the fires of hell. Whoosh, right here. Just pretend on this stage. And we're going to say that this clicker is a man. And this man is naturally immortal. Right? That's the pagan belief. Naturally what, everyone? Immortal. Whoosh, there's the fire, flaming, inferno, barbecue pit of hell. And so if we put man in there and man is immortal, how long before he's destroyed? Could he ever be destroyed? So then by definition, how long does this have to burn? throughout the ceaseless eternal ages. But wait a minute. What if our assumption is wrong? What if man is not naturally immortal? What if, as the Bible says, the soul that sinneth, it shall die? What if the wages of sin is death? What if God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not what? Perish. What if that's true? Then you put this guy in there and how long does he burn? Until he's burned up. If that makes sense, say amen. Whew, it's going to get even clearer though. It's going to get even clearer. I love the Bible. Can someone say amen? amen? This is hell right here. They went up on the breadth of the earth and they surrounded the camp of the saints and the beloved city and fire came down from God out of heaven and what? Devour. What does it mean to devour? It means it's gone. Right? I used to have a dog and that dog would eat pancakes. His name was Banner. And uh, in the morning, my mom would make pancakes. She always made way too many pancakes. Never could figure that out. But she'd make like three times too many pancakes. And then we'd get them all slathered up in butter and syrup. And uh, we, our, us kids couldn't finish them. And she'd put them over in the corner. And Banner, our Siberian Husky, would come in. And those things would be devoured in about 20 seconds flat. He'd lick the plate. He'd lick the floor. He'd lick the bottom side of the plate. I mean, you, you could have sent a search team in there, a forensics team in there, a CSI team in there. You couldn't have found one little remaining bit of pancake or syrup or butter. Amen? Those things were devoured. Are we all together? That's what the word means. It means devoured. It means it's gone. It means game over. Verse 15, And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the what? Lake of fire. Where they ride throughout the ceaseless eternal ages because God put them there for what they did in 70 years? Oh, come on, beloved. What kind of God is that? That's like, that's like sentencing someone to the, to, the, to the electrical chair for what they, they jaywalked. No, 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 no. The crime has, the punishment has to fit the what? Crime. So let's think about this. God's going to punish you for millions upon billions upon trillions upon quadrillions of years for a mistake that you made over the 60, 70, 40 year course of your life. Come on. The devil has had a heyday with this one. And people after, I mean, any intelligent person, in my humble belief, any intelligent person can look at that and can say, that is not logical. Amen. Someone say amen. I mean, before I became a Christian, I thought, you've got to be kidding. I, your God of love is a God of hatred and vengeance to punish someone throughout the ceaseless eternal ages for what they've done in 60 or 70 years. I mean, I was, I was a heathen and I knew that that was unreasonable. Mm. And then I came to the Bible. And instead of taking what somebody had taught me, what a church had taught me, what, what somebody had told me, I said, well, let's just see what the Bible says. And you know what I discovered? The Bible doesn't teach that ridiculous doctrine. The devil made it up. Someone say amen. You say, well, what does the Bible teach then? Well, let's see what it says. First of all, it says, I saw a new heaven and a new what? Earth. So if a new heaven and a new earth is going to be made and hell takes place on planet earth, do you know what you know for sure? Hell can't burn forever. Amen? amen. Well, how could it? How could it? Does that make sense? Powerful. It's going to get even better, though. Jude chapter... Well, actually, look at this. We're right there in the middle of your study guide. Remember that it is the Greeks, Babylonians, Egyptians, and others who believe this idea of the immortality of the soul. It is not a biblical concept. It is called, as we've already discussed, anthropological dualism. That's a lot of syllables. It basically means that man is twofold. He has a temporal body that, that uh, goes away, and he has an eternal soul. But the Bible never teaches that man has an eternal soul. What it does teach is that God will give you the gift of immortality if you accept the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. Amen? Amen. Now, I've just given you a few texts here. I could have literally given you ten times the number of texts that are on this sheet right here. Let's see what the Bible says about the wicked. According to the Bible, the fate of the wicked is as follows. They will die. They will what? Die. 
die. So right there, Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the wages of sin is death. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, I'm quoting it for you there, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, he said, do not fear those who are able to destroy the body, but rather fear those who can destroy both body and soul in what? Hell. Hell. That's exactly right. According to the Bible, the wicked will perish. We already said that in John chapter 3, verse 16. They will be burnt up. Let's look at that one, Malachi chapter 4, last book of the Old Testament. See if you can beat me there. Last, you're already there. Good for you. Matthew, Malachi chapter 4. Malachi chapter 4, last book of the Old Testament, just before the book of Matthew. So if you can find Matthew, just go whoop, one book back and you got it. If you get to Zechariah, you've gone a little bit too far. Malachi, what chapter, everyone? Verse 4, it says, For behold, the day is coming. The day is what? Coming. So the day wasn't in Malachi's day. The day is coming, burning like a what? An oven. And all the proud, yes, all who do wickedly will be stubble. The day that is coming that will burn them, what's the next word? Burns them. What's the next word? Up, says the Lord of hosts. It will leave them neither root nor branch. They're gone. Look at verse 3. You shall trample the wicked, for they shall be what under your feet? Ashes under the soles of your feet on the day that I will do this, says the Lord of hosts. They're burned to ashes. They don't burn and burn and burn and burn and burn and burn and burn. They burn till they burn up. If someone can, can believe that, say amen. Ah, absolutely powerful. Now look at this. They will be devoured by the flames. We already read that in Revelation chapter 20, verse 9. The fires come down and devour them. They will be utterly consumed. Psalm chapter 30, uh, 37, verse 20. Isaiah 47, 14. They will be turned to ashes. Malachi 4, 3. We saw that. They will die the second death. Die the second what? Death. death. Oh, well, that makes sense now, doesn't it? So the second death would be the second death. That, that makes sense? The second death would be the second death. If that makes sense, say amen. Notice, it doesn't say the second death is the second life. Those people that don't put their faith in Jesus do not get to live throughout the ceaseless eternal ages. I mean, think about it. What's the devil's favorite thing to do? To deceive and to harass and to make your life miserable, yes or no? And so the picture that we have of hell is here's the devil, and he's got his little, you know, barbecue prod, and, and here's people just, you know, writhing in the hot brimstone lava, and the devil, throughout the ceaseless eternal of ages, is on God's divine payroll to poke you and I down into the lava. Is that realistic? No, it's not only realistic, it's an absolute caricature of the character of God. Someone say amen. You can't find that anywhere in scriptures. I mean, is God going to keep the devil on the divine payroll to do the very thing he loves to do throughout the ceaseless eternal ages? No, the Bible says that the devil is going to be destroyed. You say amen? Amen. Look at this. They will die the second death. They will suffer destruction. We already read that, 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 9. I think I've got Philippians 3, 19 up here. I'll come back to it if I do. They will be as though they had not been, Obadiah 16, and Satan himself will be totally destroyed. Can you say amen? amen. Uh, that old rascal ain't going to stick around forever. He's not only going to take a vacation, he's going to take a one great big long vacation. Back page. What about everlasting fire? The Bible does speak of eternal fire in Jude 7, but this is a fire that has eternal, what's the next word? consequences. It does not burn for eternity. In fact, in the context, it speaks of Sodom and Gomorrah as what? Examples of this eternal fire. We might rightly ask the question, is Sodom and Gomorrah burning right now? No, absolutely not. You can write that down. Jude chapter 1, verse 7. As Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities around them in similar manner to these, having given themselves over to sexual immorality, notice the rest, and gone after strange flesh, are set forth as a what? An example, suffering the vengeance of what kind of fire? But are Sodom and Gomorrah still burning today? No. no, so an eternal fire is a fire that has eternal consequences. Amen. It's not a fire that has to burn throughout the ceaseless eternal ages. The only reason we believe that is that we were told that we were naturally immortal. But if we're not naturally immortal, then that does not have to mean at all. In fact, it's clear in the context. Here's 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 6. And turning the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah into what? Hey, we just read that in Malachi, didn't we? That the wicked will be turned to ashes. Condemn them with destruction, making them and what? Example to those who afterward would live ungodly. Now, is anyone unclear as to what happened to Sodom and Gomorrah? The Bible says that God destroyed them with fire and brimstone. God did what? Destroyed, destroyed them. He did not allow them to be tortured for centuries and centuries and eons and millennia. They were destroyed. And Jude says, and Peter says, that's an example of eternal fire. Not fire that burns throughout the ceaseless eternal ages, but fire that has eternal, what's that word I'm going to say? consequences. That's exactly right. Let's go on here. Someone says eternal punishment. Look at that right there on your study guide. The Bible also speaks of eternal punishment in Matthew chapter 25 verse 46. This simply means punishment that has eternal what? 
consequences. Notice that that's why it's called the second death. There's no resurrection from the second death. Notice the phrase is eternal punishment, not eternal punishing. Is there a difference, yes or no? Huge difference. You won't find the phrase eternal punishing anywhere in your Bible. Punishing is a verb, right? The, the eternal punishing. No, 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 no. It's eternal punishment. That is punishment that has eternal ramifications. If that makes sense, say amen. Okay, the difference is enormous. The only reason that someone would insist that this phrase means eternal conscious torment is if they already believed in the non-biblical teaching that man is naturally what? Immortal. Immortal. You've got it. This teaching, however, as we have seen, is not biblical. Someone says, well, the Bible says it's going to happen forever. Ooh, good question. I like Bible students. By the way, the people that don't ask questions make me more nervous than the people that do. You got questions? Praise the Lord Jesus. I like questions. It makes me more nervous when you don't have questions. Amen? It means you're just taking what I say. But don't take what I say. Take what the Bible says. Can you say amen to that? Amen. Now look at this. This man, and by the way, I'm passionate about this because I believe this is what the Bible teaches. But I'm always willing. Don't come up to me and tell me, well, you know, the Spirit told me that what you were preaching wasn't true. Don't tell me that. Don't tell me that. It just doesn't feel right in my soul. Don't tell me that, beloved. Because if I have to trust your indigestion or what the Bible says, I'm going to trust the Bible. Amen? Can you say amen? I mean, I've had person after person after person after person come to these meetings and say, well, you know, it just doesn't feel right. And I look at them in the eye and say, listen, sister, I love you, brother. I love you, but you, you are forcing me to make a very easy decision here. I have to trust the, some feeling that's taking place in your guts or I have to trust what God says in his word. And I'm always going to take what God says in his word. And you too, amen? I mean, how many nights would you have said if I would have stood up and said, you know, I just got this feeling in my stomach that this is what this prophecy means. Would you have kept coming? He said, oh, yeah, we went down to this meeting and this fella told us how we felt. No, 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 no. You're coming because the Bible's being preached and you're saying, hey, that makes sense. Can someone say amen? amen? Hallelujah. So look at this. Someone says, hey, what about the word forever? Forever in the Bible can be translated until the end of the what? The age. Look there at your study guide. And this might seem like an unusual question, how long is forever? The Bible does use the word forever in the context of a final punishment, but several things must be considered before arriving at unwarranted conclusions. Number one, the word forever means as long as the thing shall last. Number two, forever in the New Testament can be translated an age or until the end of the age. Number three, the word forever is used in the Bible to refer to things that lasted for a finite period of time. For example, Jonah was in the belly of the fish forever. But how many days was Jonah in the belly of the fish? Three days. But the Bible says he was in there forever. 1 Samuel chapter 1 says that Samuel was given to the Lord forever. But then it says in verse 28, he was given until he died. Given until he what? Died. died. And Exodus chapter 21 verse 6 says that if someone becomes a slave, you have to put a, an earring through his ear or an awl through his ear, and that's a sign that he's a slave forever. But it goes on to say that after seven years, he's released. Beloved, the word forever modifies the thing that it's talking about. So if we say God lives forever, of course, the nature of God defines forever as throughout the ceaseless eternal ages. But if it says that someone, the smoke of their torment ascends forever, it would only mean throughout the ceaseless eternal ages if that thing was by nature immortal. But if it's not by nature immortal, it means it would burn and burn and burn and burn until there was nothing more to burn. And if that makes sense, say amen. Very simple. And by the way, if you're writhing in the flames of hell and being burned up, it's going to feel like, guess what? Forever. You've got it. Jesus endured hell, and this is probably the single most powerful thing. Here we go. All right, yeah, I better read that. I better read that real quick. John, chapter, John Stott said, As a committed evangelical Christian, my question must be and is not what does my what? Heart tell me, but what does God's Word say? If you believe that, say amen. And in order to answer this question, we need to survey the biblical material afresh and to open our minds. He's not a member of my church. He's just a conservative theologian. He's saying, hey, look, we've got to look at the Bible. Not just our hearts to the possibility that Scripture points in the direction of what is that word? Annihilation. And that the doctrine of eternal conscious torture has to yield to the supreme authority of what? Absolutely, we've already been over that. And John Stott's the one who said, It cannot, I think, therefore be replied that it is impossible to destroy human beings because they are immortal for the immortality and therefore the what? Indestructibility of the soul is a Greek, not a biblical concept. Where did they get that idea from? They didn't get it from the Bible. They got it from the Greeks. So the first death is the death that we die as a natural result of living in a sinful world. Amen? And all kinds of people die the first death, but there's a resurrection from the first death. Can someone say amen? And I want to be in the first resurrection. It says the second death is eternal death and is the result of personal rebellion against God. And there is no resurrection from the second death, if that makes sense. Say amen. Okay, so here we go. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28, we already quoted this. And do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the 
soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body. Where? In hell. So Jesus stumbles into the Garden of Gethsemane in Matthew chapter 26. And as he falls down to his face, what does he say? My soul is exceedingly what? Sorrowful, even to the point of what? Death. Let me rephrase that. Jesus stumbles into the Garden of Gethsemane. The sin of the world is being laid upon him. And he says, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful to the point of death. In other words, my soul is dying. Now, beloved, if your soul is dying, you are going through what? Hell. That's what we just read there in Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. Look at it again. Do not fear those who kill the body, but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who, can, who is able to destroy both the soul and the body. Where? In hell. So if Jesus' soul was dying, if he was saying, oh, something is happening inside of me, the weight of the world feels like it's upon me, the sin of the world is rending me from my Father, he's going through the experience of hell. Look right there at the bottom of your study guide. Praise the Lord Jesus. We made it. Jesus said as he stumbled into the garden of Gethsemane that his soul was exceedingly sorrowful even unto what? Death. Compare this with Matthew 10, 28, which we've already done. Jesus endured this horrific experience, the second death, for you on the cross. Someone say amen. Here's the good news about hell, beloved. Jesus would rather go to hell for you than live in heaven without you. Can someone say amen? amen. Jesus would rather go to hell for you then live in heaven without you. Here's the good news about hell. Number one, no one is burning right now. Can someone say amen? I hope that's good news to that person who had a loved one or a son or a daughter or a friend who died and they didn't know how their case was with God. No one is burning right now. Number two, if you want to believe the Bible, now if you want to believe your traditions and your ideas of all this Greek mythology, you can believe it. But if you want to believe what the Bible says, no one is burning right now. Number two, no one will burn eternally. Someone say amen. Now, again, if you want to believe that, if that's the picture of God that you want to create in your mind, fine, you are welcome to do that. But that's not the biblical picture. And don't confuse the God of the Bible with a God that would burn people throughout the ceaseless eternal ages for what they did in 50, 60, or 70 years. My Bible says God is love. Amen. Amen. Number three, hell is fair. Number four, you don't have to be there. That's good news, isn't it? Someone say Amen. And number five, Jesus would rather go to hell for you than live in heaven without you. Two questions as we close tonight. Number one, is this clear, yes or no? Yes. Beloved, the Bible says that God is love, and I hope that I've done my very best to convey to you tonight this great, grand, biblical truth of hell and of the millennium. It is not something that makes God out to be the greatest terror, terrorist in the universe. God is the greatest, compassionate being of love in the universe. Yes, he is just. Yes, he is gracious. Yes, he is mighty. But his punishments and his judgments will always be consistent with the crime and the infraction. That is what the Bible teaches. Amen. Amen. As we close tonight, I want to ask you two questions. Number one, was tonight's presentation clear? Yes. That's all I want to know. Here's the second question. Are you willing? I don't care if it's tonight's subject or any subject. Are you willing? And I mean this with every bit of sincerity and authenticity and transparency that I can muster. Are you willing to take any belief that you have? What did I say? Amen. Any belief that you have and surrender it if it's not consistent with what the Bible teaches, yes or no? That's all I want to know. Beloved, you do that. You do that. I'll do that, and by the grace of God, we will arrive at biblical truth by studying His Word. Someone say amen.